Um, there's a monster inside you. <laughs> I'm sorry. And inside me and, and inside everyone. Um, you know, if you read Freud, uh, I think it's in Civilization and its Discontents, and perhaps through a lot of Freud, uh, you can see the influence of Plato. It's just, uh, it's there. And there's one passage in, in Book Nine, which I, it almost seems like I've read it in Freud. I, I, I think it's in Civilization and its Discontents. He's either quoting Plato or paraphr paraphrasing Plato, or he's just sort of unconsciously repeating the kinds of things that Plato said in the Republic. Uh, and that's in, in our edition on page 270, when they're talking about appetites, which, of course, very important, especially when we're talking about the degeneration from the aristocratic city and the aristocratic person into, finally, the tyrannical city, and the tyrannical person, where the appetites get the better of you, which is so important to this book. Uh, but you know, what he describes there is really kind of shocking. Uh, uh, Adamantus asks him, you know, what, what appetites are you talking about? And he says, Socrates says, the ones that wake up when we are asleep, whenever the rest of the soul, the rational, gentle, and ruling element, slumbers. Then the bestial and savage element, full of food or drink, comes alive, casts off sleep, and seeks to go and gratify its own characteristic instincts. You know it will dare to do anything in such a state, released and freed from all shame and wisdom. In fantasy, it does not shrink from trying to have sex with a mother or with anyone else, man, god, or beast. It will commit any foul murder, and there is no food it refuses to eat. In a word, it does not refrain from anything, no matter how foolish or shameful. Oh, wow, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, he's not criticizing anyone there. I don't think he's just saying, this is the way it is. There's just think about what you dream about or what you have dreamt about. Um, and uh, you just have to acknowledge uh, that there's a very strange uh, and perhaps uh, alien, uh, savage, selfish, and in some ways perverted part of you, man. We, this, we all have it. And, you know, it, uh, the, the proof of that, he says, comes out in, in what we dream about. Of course, you know, the connection to Freud there is just it's too obvious to mention. Um, and, you know, Freud took what he took from it. I mean, but Plato wasn't thinking about Freud. I, I think that would be crazy to say. But, um, you know, that, that's what just really, when I read reread Book Nine, not having read it for many years, uh, I was just absolutely struck by that. And, you know, um, we think of the book as a whole, its argument for the just life, uh, and think of the way that Plato has this notion of justice, which is really an internal thing. It's not about primarily about how we treat each other. It's about how we arrange the internal parts or aspects or elements of our soul, our self, um, the dominance of our reason over our desires is the, it's gotta be, you know, key to the whole thing, establishing that dominance. Becoming a just person is to a large extent, I think in platonic terms, becoming a reasonable person. And, uh, you know, if we ask ourselves, you know, what, what is he, getting at in these last three books of the Republic, or at least I ask myself, you know, what are they for? What is, first of all, it's just a tour de force. Uh, Plato as a poet uh, comes out uh, in, a, in, in almost a, you know, it's just unrestrained way, ironically. I mean, Plato is just simply in, in a way just displaying his, his excellence as a poet and his incredible imagination. You know, and, and like I said, if my interpretation is right and, and the, the argument uh, has essentially been made by the end of book seven, then in a way, the last three books are unnecessary for the philosophical argument, but they're great. I mean, 
we're all, we're so glad we have them, right? We're so glad that I'm so glad that Plato didn't stop at, at book seven. But why? Because what he's doing here just seems so powerful. And perhaps there, you know, it's not that there aren't important philosophical points that are made in in, in book uh, book nine here. Uh, in fact, they're incredibly important. They just seem to be reinforcing things that have already been said. But this passage where he describes the um, the anarchy, the, the shamelessness of the of the appetites is uh, uh, is just an admission of just how powerful uh, the desires, the irrational part of us, how, how powerful those things really are. That is, becoming a reasonable person is no easy task. Um, because there's a powerfully unreasonable part of us. So that getting that part of us in proper control and arranging the parts of the self in the way that Plato thinks we, or ostensibly the way that Plato thinks we have to do, is really is probably a lifelong task. The most powerful part of Book Nine, um, and an important I think philosophically is uh, again Plato, Plato as poet. Uh, when he makes a new image, I'm sorry if I can't find it. Um, this is around page 292 in our edition. He makes this new image which really is a more poetic version of what he's already described in terms of his theory of human nature in earlier books. But he says, you know, think of a person, think of a human being, but then think within that human being of another human being. But also within that human being, think of a lion. And also within that human being, think of a multi-headed beast. It's always changing its forms in this chaotic way. Well, okay, I'm, I'm thinking of that, a human being, and within the human being is a human being, and within the human being is a lion, and within the human being is this ever-changing, chaotic, multi-headed, multi-form beast. Well, that's you, and that's me, and that's everyone, okay? <clears throat> There's no getting around it. There's a beast there's a beast inside of us all. There's a monster. He, he or she is a monster. She'll do anything. He'll do anything. It will do anything. It'll take whatever it wants and, and, or, or try to take whatever it wants. And, and that's just the way it is. And we're sort of stuck with that. And, and so unlike other creatures, we have to work on ourselves you know? and, and, we have to be educated and we have to educate ourselves and we have to put ourselves in proper order. This makes us, this is a really incredible sort of, I think, uh, revelation about human beings and how they differ from other creatures is that other creatures seem to be, they're born and they do what they do and they're, you know, that's it. A human being isn't like that. A human being has to work on him or herself. And if we think of that image, the, the work is towards getting the human being within the human being in control of the other parts. Using the human being, using the force of the lion within us, which is the spirited part, obviously, to get the multi-headed beast under control. Um, to Not to kill it, because you can't kill it, maybe you wouldn't want to kill it, but to uh, tame it, he says. To, 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 to make it less brutal, to try to humanize it, to try to make our desires more humane. Uh, uh, that image is uh, fantastic, of course. And, uh, you know, maybe it's not completely needed in terms of completing the argument because it's in a way it's sort of repeating things that Plato had set up before. But what a, what a wonderful poetic image uh, that he provides for us.